presentation. I'm Jonathan Lee, and I'll be talking about our work on non-intrusive load management under forecast uncertainty and energy constrained microgrids. Managing energy scarcity is a fairly ubiquitous issue faced by microgrids that are designed to operate autonomously in islanded mode for long periods of time. These microgrids could be those designed in response to power shutoffs or those that are built in off-grid environments. In these cases, reducing load can be much more cost-effective than increasing reserve capacity to handle periods of time when there might be especially high load or low renewable production. The question that we address is how to curtail consumption when energy is scarce. Probably the two most common approaches proposed in the literature are directly controlling a subset or all of the loads of the microgrid and using real-time pricing signals to influence consumption. These approaches are very promising in the long run. However, they face some challenges and hurdles in implementing today and are thus not widely used or in many cases used at all in practice. Instead, we focus on load limiting at the meter, which is easily implemented by programming meters to disconnect a customer if the load limit is exceeded and broadcasting the load limit to the customer so they can adjust their usage accordingly. This approach is not intrusive and provides a reliable mechanism of preventing overconsumption. Load limiting at the meter has not been widely discussed in the literature but has been recognized as a viable approach. In their 2016 paper, Margulis and Oren advocate for this approach but focus their work on how the customers should optimally bid for load limit increments under uncertainty rather than how the operator should set load limits. The problem that we address for how the operator should set load limits is connected to work on stochastic microgrid energy management systems, where a number of papers have framed various versions of the problem of setting generation and consumption through direct load control or pricing as stochastic model predictive control problems. This work extends the stochastic EMS framing to include load limiting control at the meter. And we find that this actually adds complexity because subject to load limits, load becomes a random variable that is indirectly controlled. In this work, we show how this can be formulated using different optimization mathematical programming techniques. In this section, we describe the model formulation before moving on to the computational experiments and results. In our system model, we separate the decision models made by agents from the microgrid physical model. The decision models are optimal choice problems for the agents over the receding horizon, where the two agents that we consider are the microgrid controller or the operator, whose decision is essentially what limits load limits to set given the forecast and state of charge of all batteries in the system. The second are the individual customers who make a decision of what loads to use and therefore determine what the power consumption is given the load limit constraints that they face. The microgrid model's purpose is to emulate the physical dynamics where we include power sharing amongst distributed energy resources, modern modeled as a quasi-static simulation of tie line bias and droop control of distributed solar and storage resources. We also have a physical or a model of a meter that disconnects all of the customer's load if the limit is exceeded and loads that are modeled as individual appliances that are controlled by the customer. The customer decision is based around the idea of activities. An activity is associated with a load and is given a schedule where each activity is randomly assigned a start time and a time to complete and then initialized to a queued state. As time evolves, a customer moves the activity to in progress at the appropriate time where it can either be completed or interrupted. And a customer may also cancel an activity before it begins. Loads are in an on state, which is when they are connected by the customer and when power is available. And the customer decides to cancel or interrupt activities to comply with the load limits, solving essentially a knapsack problem or a discrete choice problem. 
The customer derives value in the activity that are completed and pays a cost when they are interrupted and have no effect when the activity is canceled except for foregone utility. No load shifting is modeled here, but the customer's decision is essentially to maximize their completed value minus cost and adjust the activities accordingly. The operator's decision is to maximize the expected benefits for all of the customers over the time horizon T. In this problem, the true customer utility is unknown to the operator. So in the operator's model, we approximate customer utility with a quadratic function of power consumed. This function preserves that as more power is consumed, the customer derives more benefits, but introduces a diminishing marginal return to consumption that would not be captured by a common linear model. This idea is that it's better to keep the lights on by reducing high powered loads and keeping energy available for high value, low power loads. Of course, this will not actually always be effective if the customer relies on high power, high value loads, but we propose that it's a reasonable assumption to use in practice. We treat power consumption, which is the argument to the benefit function, as not directly controllable, but a random variable that depends on the unconstrained demand, PL, and the load limit, L. We assume the relationship that the actually consumed power, PU, will be equal to the minimum of the unconstrained demand and the load limit. This relationship introduces a source of complexity because it is a non-convex constraint in the operator's optimal decision problem. To formalize the decision problem, we use a set of variables where the state is the energy at each battery. The action or control decision U is the load limit for each customer. And the operator also takes into account a scenario forecast W, which is a random variable consisting of solar power and unconstrained load forecast over the time horizon. The operator's decision is a sequential decision problem where from time t they consider a set of discrete points over the time horizon. At each time we use the dynamic programming framework to define the q function as the expectation of the current benefits in that period plus the sum of future benefits which is denoted by the value function at the next time step v. The value function is the maximum benefit that can be achieved given that state and forecast. We assume at the end of the period that there's zero value to having additional energy left in the batteries, but this could easily be modified to be some other linear quadratic function of the state of charge. In the model, we rely on a set of linear dynamics that capture the state of charge evolution. However, not shown here are also a set of constraints that implicitly relate the state of charge to the action and the forecast realization through conservation of power and energy. The operator's optimal action is the solution to maximizing Q at the initial time step, which we call the optimal policy. The last missing piece here, how is the forecast to be updated over time? The forecast is modeled as an ensemble or scenario forecast where each scenario has a probability of, an, of occurrence. This is straightforward enough, but there's still some ambiguity in how each of these forecasts relates over time. One interpretation is a trajectory interpretation where each scenario is a distinct path. In the diagram, you can see that for a given scenario that forecasts solar generation and load, if we take the trajectory interpretation and walk through the state space of energy storage, we can see that there is a one path that corresponds with each scenario. Thus, there are S paths in the state space for a fixed action. You can also see under this that at time t plus one, the operator would essentially know which trajectory they were on after having realized the forecast realization at time t, which reduces the complexity of the problem to a two-stage stochastic program. The alternative is a Markov interpretation where the scenarios 
at each time step are independent of previous time steps. So under this interpretation for the same forecast, you can see that there are actually s to the t different paths in the state space. As you can now go from you know, blue to red, back to blue, or blue to blue to blue, essentially. Both interpretations are valid depending on what they're actually being generated from. So in this work, we actually compare both and examine how they yield different results. Under the trajectory interpretation, the decision problem objective reduces to the sum over scenarios of the first time step benefits plus the sum of all the benefits of the remaining time steps. The key idea here is that this is a two-stage problem because once the first forecast realization is observed, the remainder of the trajectory follows deterministically under this trajectory interpretation. Also not shown here are a linear set of constraints that ensure the standard operating and power, operating limits and power balance. We address the non-convex function for power consumed in each scenario with a set of linear constraints and a binary variable for each customer and scenario, which results in an MIQP, mixed integer quadratic program, with the number of binary variables equal to the number of customers times the number of scenarios, and the number of continuous variables and constraints on the order of the product, the number of customers, scenarios, and time steps. In contrast, under the Markov interpretation, we employ a finite horizon dynamic programming algorithm that uses state space aggregation to consider a virtual battery with the sum of all the energy and all the batteries in the system that is discretized into a set of X samples. You start at the final time step, compute the approximate value function for each of these samples of the state space, and then use a linear interpolation to approximate values in between the samples so that when we repeat iterating backwards in time, we can always solve for the value function given this interpretation of the value function at the next, given this interpolation of the value function at the next time step. The result is a sequence of smaller mixed integer quadratic programs that each have a dimension on the order of n to the time set. To evaluate the models, we set up computational experiments that compare each of the decision models over a number of trials. In our setup, we introduce a number of parameters that we hold fixed across trials that dictate the number of customers, scenarios, and timing of the simulation. For the customer, we start with a table that dictates the probability that a given activity will start at an hour of a day on a certain day type. This table and the associated loads with activities were constructed to qualitatively model residential household consumption. In our setup, we ensured there was relatively low storage and solar capacity to really test how this would respond under significant energy scarcity. In each trial, we randomly vary what we call confounding variables that are the start day of the year to get some normalization across seasonality, the activity schedule itself that's generated randomly from the table, and time, different time series for what the irradiance forecast and realizations are, as well as load forecasts that were generated by randomly simulating these activity schedules. We also varied the distributed energy resource assignment to different customers to support ancillary work that looked at how this affected power sharing. To derive our main result, we compared five load limiting controllers. First is a baseline of no control that doesn't set any load limits. The second is a feedback mechanism that's a heuristic that would set load limits depending on the state of charge without using any forecasts. The third is a deterministic 
that is essentially the operator decision model with only a single scenario forecast. So it removes the expectation and the sequential nature of the decisions. The third and or the fourth and fifth are the two-stage trajectory and the dynamic programming Markov models that were discussed previously. To compare them, we use the following metrics. The realized value of the quadratic benefit function, B, the realized customer utility, and the average service availability index, which is essentially the fraction of time that power is available. You can see here that the three predicted models improve customer utility despite not having knowledge of the utility functions themselves. The objective is actually not improved very much because of the imperfect knowledge of the customer response, but it drives the system to the qualitative performance that we want. Essentially validating the assumption that diminishing margin in the utility, this quadratic benefit function B, will result in higher utility for the customer. We also investigated how the two stochastic models compare against the deterministic. As you might expect, the stochastic approaches better anticipate the bad outcomes. You can see here that the deterministic model overestimates the utility. This is shown in the graph that it predicts a higher value of the objective than either the two-stage or the approximate dynamic programming approach ex ante, though they have similar ex post values. We also see that stochastic models impose load limits more of the time, but at less restrictive levels when imposed, shown by the increased percent change in both the load limit itself and the percentage of time that the load limit is instated, any load limit is instated. Related to this, there's a large reduction in interruption cost in the stochastic models and only very small improvements in the value from completing activities. The interruption cost is relatively small compared to the completion value in magnitude, that is, meaning that the stochastic models only slightly improve total customer utility. You also see that all of the predictive models actually overestimate utility, so the deterministic one overestimates it the most. And we assume that this is most likely because of the assumption that the utilized power being equal to the minimum of the load limit and the uncurtailed load is actually an overestimate of what consumption will be because the customer is choosing from a set of dis discrete appliances. We've made all the code available for this project on GitHub. Um, there's two packages. One is the microgrid simulator that includes our operator and decision models and the tie line bias control. And that's available in one repository. And then there's another repository that includes all of the code to reproduce these computational experience results, experiment results. Please go ahead and contribute and use this and um, send your feedback on how we can improve these modules. Thank you. With that, I'd like to thank my co-authors and support from the National Science Foundation, collaboration with Nissan Road and Zola Electric, and feedback from my peers at UC Berkeley. Thank you. So thank you, Jonathan. It's, uh, you can unmute yourself. It's time uh, for questions. Um, so, I, yeah. I don't know so why, but I don't see the, ah, okay, they, they came back. Um, so do you see the, you can take the questions? Sure, uh, yeah. I'll, I can can maybe don't repeat them, well, uh, read them before. Mm -hmm. So the first question is, how are the scenarios generated? Um, and the basic model assumption is that those are given from an external forecasting um, engine for the experiments to validate the model. We use, we basically for solar took 15 years of data um, and then randomly selected one year to use as the realization um, and the other um, ones to use as the forecast. 
And we did, for the loads, just generated a set of scenarios by um, random simulation. Uh, the second question is, are, is the data are also in the GitHub repository? Um, and yes, they are. Um, so it should be relatively easy to um, run a smaller version of the experiments that only takes a few minutes to run the full, um, reproducing the full results would take a couple hours to run, depending on the, the machine. Thank you. Maybe uh, uh, the last uh, quick uh, question. Uh, in your result, you compare different uh, uh, cases. Can you maybe uh, clarify a bit what is uh, a proportional feedback uh, case? Because uh, uh, yes. while, while reading the paper, I, I got a bit confused and sound it was applied. Well, this was applied in any case. Uh, but apparently it's a, it's a separate case. So I didn't really understand. Can you maybe clarify? Okay. That? So the, yeah, I apologize for the, the confusion. Um, so the, the proportional feedback load control is um, something that's used in practice that is basically just triggered by the state of charge without using any forecast. So when the state of charge of batteries gets low, um, a load limit is put into place. And this is something that's, you know, you can program into um, a lot of small power um, backup inverters and things like that. There's another control that I didn't discuss in the presentation that is presented in the paper um, that's used to set the power injection set points for the distributed energy resources. Um, and that is used in um, as a separate layer to the load control, which I just didn't present here for the sake of time. Um, but that was basically a simple feedback controller just to keep battery state of charge balanced so that no individual batteries were drained completely so that they could keep um, providing, um, providing their instantaneous power capacity. Does that answer the question? Yeah, okay, thank you. This is clear now. I uh, got a bit confused because of these two things. Uh, so it's clear now, thank you. Um, I don't know if we have any other questions from the audience. No, I don't think so. So, um, so uh, I found the paper very interesting and uh, would like, I would be happy to discuss it further, but we, unfortunately, we don't really have time now. So um, I propose to move to the next uh, speaker. Thank you, Jonathan.